which actually brings me to, to a thought that I'm really curious of that I don't think I've ever heard you talk about, or very rarely hear people talk about is, is, you know, the importance of our thoughts, but the, the chemicals that those release and what they create in the body. And has there been any studies done on, you know, people say misery love, loves company, right? So there's people that are just miserable and miserable and they've been miserable for years and they have this, this feeling and these chemicals that are inside the body. Is there any studies done on the body being addicted to certain chemicals? So even though somebody doesn't want to be miserable anymore, mm -hmm. the feeling is just so comfortable and so normal to them that they put themselves in that state because it's just what their body's chemically used to having at all points in time. Yeah, that's a really good question. So the, there there's an interesting study um, done by a very controversial guy named Robert Heath. These were studies that were published mainly in the 1960s. You couldn't do them now. Um, where they took humans mm -hmm. and planted them with electrodes in their brain, so drilled down below the skull. Mm -hmm. These weren't people that had epilepsy. These were just people that volunteered for these studies. So in my lab, we've recorded from human brains. We get we use patients that have epilepsy that have consented to us exploring fear and other mm -hmm. things. These are studies where Heath and colleagues went in and literally stuck electrodes in the brain and gave people buttons so they could, you know, press button A, B, C, or D to stimulate different areas of the mm -hmm. brain. And they simply asked, where do you like to stimulate? So they'd press one button and the person would go into a rage. This is actually how the brain works. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. like, just like rage. And they'd, you know, they turn that one off and they'd say, well, that didn't feel good. Mm -hmm. um, they press another one, they'd feel drunk or happy or and you'd think that the area that they would like to stimulate would be the one that causes happiness. Mm -hmm. But actually the number one area of the brain across all these subjects that people elected to self-stimulate, given the option, was an area called the central median nucleus of the ventral midline thalamus. And the subjective experience that they had was mild frustration and anger. Hmm. Now that's interesting and kind of says something about our species in general. Yeah. Uh, Fast forward, so those studies were done in the 60s. Fast forward to 2018, a graduate student in my lab named Lindsay Soleil published a paper in Nature showing that even small animals, a mouse that's in a fearful situation of like a predator looming in to grab, to get it. We don't use real predators, we use virtual predators, but mm -hmm. mice don't have great vision, so we can trick them pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Mice will switch from a fear mode to a confrontational mode they will literally stand in the face of fear if you stimulate the equivalent brain area in the mouse brain. And we've done some experiments on humans exploring sort of similar types of things about how fear and various processes of anxiety are housed in the brain. The net export from all of this, what to take away from all this is that we have areas of the brain that give us the sensation and the subjective experience of being frustrated and angry. Mm -hmm. And they have connections to the dopamine system. Hmm. So anger, frustration, and I would argue complaining too, but I'm kind of <laughs> inserting that too, are, re are internally reinforced. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we should just be aware of. I don't think that means that we're wired to be miserable. I think it, I don't think that it means that we like being miserable. I think that being miserable and complaining mm -hmm. and feeling frustrated has a rewarding element to it. And so as a biologist, or if anyone that wants to think about this stuff scientifically, you don't want to get too far outside the margins of what this means. But what it probably means is because this circuitry exists in mice and it exists in humans, is that this frustration circuit probably served us well in some regard at some point. Mm -hmm. Now, there was probably a time, let's just say 2000 years ago, where we were short on food, weather was terrible, and we needed to do some serious digging to find water. We mm -hmm. need to do, you know, we need to do stuff. Yeah. And if you kind of dug into the ground and you hit stone and you just were frustrated and you quit, well, then we wouldn't be here today, mm -hmm. right? They wouldn't have had children and they wouldn't have had children. Mm -hmm. and they wouldn't, we wouldn't be here today. The, if you can link frustration to a sense of reward, well, then you go seeking errors. So this is kind of an error seeking oh, mechanism. Interesting. So there's, okay. so I'm not just trying to, you know, put rose colored glasses on yeah. this, but I think that people that are complaining and they're frustrated and misery loves company, they're caught in a loop of, they're getting just enough reward that they're continuing to turn around in a circle. Yeah. And it feels, it almost feels kind of good. We see a lot of this in the poor behavior out there, right? And especially on social media, mm -hmm. you see people getting into this these battles on social media oh, yeah. or the various elements of people like got I, gotcha culture kind mm -hmm. of stuff where one side says this, the other side says that, and it feels like a victory. But 
I think that, you know, outside the real, you know, the legal system and the proper channels for working through things in society, we, we are seeing a lot more of this and it's just something to be aware of. Um, and I don't think it's terrible. I think that when we're feeling frustrated, that's a sign to us that we need to adjust our behavior, mm -hmm. but we can't get caught in the tide pool of, you know, just going around and around and seeking frustration. I saw this a lot last year where there was a lot of anxiety in the world, understandably. Mm -hmm. um, and, but then the shedding of anxiety became its own kind of thing. It became its own long discussions about things for which there was really nothing to do at that moment. Mm -hmm. And so I think we all have to be careful not to get stuck in those little traps. Our nervous system has, has great accelerators and ability to push us out of ditches of, of different kinds, psychological ditches and physical ditches, but it also has these little traps set in it because they, if they're not used properly, they can lead to great dysfunction. For sure. And, and that's what I would say about dopamine and, and addiction, right? That the, the same dopamine circuit exists to allow us to learn and create great works of music and science and entertainment and information, et cetera, as lead to addiction. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of degrees, how often you're spending time in that circuit. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you familiar with Dr. Joe Dispenza? I, I know of him. I, I, people have asked me about his work. I confess yeah. I, I, I'm, so I'm really bad about this. I, um, I confess I spend so much time reading science mm -hmm. stuff and I know a little bit of who's out there and what's yeah. out there. So people have mentioned him to me, but I'm yeah. not familiar with his work. Yeah. I'm curious. So, I'm so curious. I can't really comment on him or his work. Yeah. Specifically. yeah. Uh, so I'll kind of give you an idea of, of what I'm curious about with what he says coming directly from you. Cause he's, you know, deals in, in neuroscience, but I don't think he's as in depth anywhere near as in depth as you are. So he says, you know, talks about thoughts and, you know, I talk about thoughts a lot, uh, thoughts, you know, or chemical or electrical signals that happen to your brain. And, and I want you to either tell me if this is correct or if it's, a, if there's different pieces, not saying that he's right or wrong, but just the, the actual mechanism of how all of this works, thoughts happen. And then there's a chemical messenger from your brain to your body, which he says are neuropeptides, which then create, make your body create hormones. But I've heard you say that hormones actually take longer. Like sometimes hormones create, it takes longer for a hormone to be, Typically, to be yeah. made. Yeah. Typically. And then the body is then communicating back with the brain saying, you know, yeah, this is the way we're feeling. So like an example would be, you know, if we've ever had a sexual thought, and then it, the thought turns our body, ramps our body up. And then our body's like, yep, we're feeling this way. And there's like a circle between it. Um, is that, is that all chemically and, and correct? Or is, I'm just curious the way coming from your side of exactly how that whole system works between thought to chemical signal, to body feeling a certain way to talking back to the brain again. Okay. Yeah. I, this is an important theme because it, it comes up, um, in reference to, um, someone whose work I am familiar with, which is, um, you know, the, the, book, The Body Keeps the Score, mm -hmm. which is like amazing name for a book, yeah. like took the best name for any book ever. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, and on the, he's yeah. on the best list yeah, it's a every great single week. I heard that book has like just such a long, long arc of success. Yeah. You know, 200 years from now, people will be like, yeah. have you read this book? Body yeah. Keeps the Score? Uh, it's a great tell for a book. It's focused mainly on um, somatization of uh, trauma mm -hmm. and some healing that can um, take place. Uh, I believe he's a psychiatrist. Yes. Um, through focusing on the body. So there, there are a couple elements here that, that I think we can accept as, as universal truths. One is that the brain and body are connected mm -hmm. through this thing we call the nervous system. Mm -hmm. That the brain has the opportunity to impact the body. There's a simple way we could do that. If right now an alarm goes off in the building, we're gonna deploy adrenaline from our adrenals and that's because we heard the alarm with our ears yeah. and our auditory system, which is up here and our adrenals are behind our kidneys mm -hmm. in our lower back. As well, if you eat something, makes you feel sick, or you eat something and it's very sugary, there's a signal sent from your gut via the vagus nerve to the brain, dopamine is released, and guess what? You're gonna want more of that sugary thing, or you're gonna want less of that thing that made you feel nauseous. It's not dopamine if you feel nauseous. But anyway, so it's bi-directional, it's two-way street. So the link between brain and body is real. Now, I would say that there are five, there are two things the nervous system does generally, reflexive action and duration path outcome type of stuff we talked about before. But there are really five things that it does, right? You have sensations, which is light and sound and stuff bombarding your nervous system and the conversion of those like photons of light and sound waves, like real physical entities into neural signals and chemical signals. That's a, that's a category of nervous system job. Mm -hmm. The next one are perceptions, which are whichever one of those sensations you happen to be paying attention to. So I wasn't paying attention to a moment ago, but now I'm feeling my left elbow on the arm of this chair. 
that happened to be sitting on and now I'm perceiving it. Yeah. But it was happening all along. I was yeah. sensing all along. Okay, then there are emotions. We can talk about those. And then there are behaviors, right? So moving my arms up and down or moving my mouth, whatever it is. And then there are thoughts. And thoughts are complicated. We don't really know how to define thoughts in the nervous system hmm. yet. So I would say it's still early days to really define what a thought is. Thoughts have an element of perception. We have to be able to anchor our attention to something specific, but they tend to be perceptions on things that include the past, the present, or future, mm -hmm. or some combination of those, mm -hmm. right? So we don't really know what thoughts are. And unfortunately, there are not good ways in the laboratory where I could... I mean, I could bring you into the laboratory. We could put electrodes in your brain or we could- um, Let's do it. If, if you let us, you know, it, <laughs> or we could put you in a scanner and we could wire up your body too. And we could say, okay, think about a red apple or something mm -hmm. like that. But I don't actually know that that's what you did because you might think red apple and then somebody that you're looking forward to seeing this evening. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's a pure thought or not. Right. We don't have a way to measure thoughts. Hmm. So I think it's a bit of a stretch to say that thoughts control hormones, control that, control the brain. But I like the idea that people are talking about a bi-directional relationship between mm -hmm. brain and body. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. And some of it is conscious and some of it is not conscious mm -hmm. or subconscious. One of the best examples of not conscious ways in which our brain is being driven by our body is the sugar example. There yeah. are beautiful data showing that if you ingest sugar, even if you don't taste it, they've done this. You numb it or you put hidden sugars, which are in many foods. Mm -hmm. You have neurons in your gut that sense sugar as well as other things and send a signal through a nerve pathway to your dopamine system. And you will crave more sugar, even though you can't taste it. Wow. So you're, you're, you are sugar seeking, not just because it tastes good, but because your gut is craving more of it. The same is true. You also amino acid seek and mm -hmm. crave. So those are subconscious. You're not aware that that's happening. Mm -hmm. And even if I tell you, you're not aware when it's happening. Okay. So that's one. The other are conscious ways where if, yes, if you were to close your eyes and do a visualization of something or somebody that you really love, chances are you're going to deploy some serotonin and some endogenous opioids and some dopamine in your brain. And you're going to have a feel good cocktail swimming around in your brain and your body will respond to that as well. You'll feel dilation of the of the periphery of you know, more blood flow to the periphery, all those things. If it's a sexual thought, mm -hmm. it, you'll have the whole response that associated with that. Mm -hmm. If you think about food, you'll have the responses associated with that. So we are very Pavlovian in that sense, mm -hmm. right? That how we think really does shape our physiology, but it's not clear exactly how that process works yet. And I think that the, tr the reason why there's been more progress made on the trauma side of it is that it really has not that community of people that treat trauma and particularly the psychiatric community have embraced the fact that people do tend to hold their trauma both in the brain and body. Yeah. Now, I'm not a big believer in the idea that like you hold your trauma in your left knee, let's fix your left knee. And then this horrible thing that happened to you three years prior is going to disappear. Right. Forget it. No, right. I'll take a hard stance on that. Like, let's talk about that and show me the example. Show me even just the anecdotal data of somebody that got their knee fixed Sure, you'll feel better if you're not in pain, mm -hmm. but can you erase a sexual assault trauma by fixing somebody's knee because their knee hurts? No, mm -hmm. like that's, that's disrespectful to people's experience. Mm -hmm. and what you want to understand is that the brain and nervous system are connected and sure, an experience could be associated with a body part. But I get a little bit, as you can tell, I get a little bit like... Um, uh, a little bit of epinephrine gets deployed in my system. <laughs> Not a lot, way. just a little. <laughs> when I, when I, um, when I hear that like everything is somaticized, yeah. th you can do a lot from the neck up. And th the best example I have, I'll back this with data, is that I happen to know people that have had their limbs blown off north of the knee. Mm -hmm. Do they not feel, of course they have feelings about that experience, but they're every bit as cognitively connected as other people. Yeah. People have all their limbs removed. So there is something special about the real estate in here. Mm -hmm. And I think it's wonderful that we're embracing the body as a powerful element within the nervous system and how to, how to steer our nervous system. Mm -hmm. But the, the real estate, including the eyes, which is part of the brain from here up mm -hmm. is special. Yeah. And we know that because if you have a, a lesion up here, oftentimes it can change your entire personality. Whereas if I cut off my right hand, I'll change, but my personality isn't going to change. Right. And I'll still feel the same about this.